My name is Amanda Basler, and the Death Investigation Training Academy was instrumental in helping me get the job that I needed in the field of death investigation. Three six one seven response to report of shots fired. The Coroner Talk podcast takes you behind the scenes with coroners, clinicians, and death investigators from around the world to provide training, news, and interviews from leading experts in the area of death investigation and scene management, bringing real stories and solid training together in one source. Now, here's your host, Darren Day. Well, hello and welcome to this week's episode of Coroner Talk. I am so happy that I am in your ears, in your speakers, however you're listening to me. Uh, I'm just happy that uh, I can provide you some sort of training and conversation every single week. And you know what? We've been doing this for several years, and I am just uh, still thrilled every single week that I can come to you. And this week is no different. I am happy to be able to share some training with you yet again. And in this episode, we're going to talk about the 10 biggest mistakes made at a destiny, the top 10 things you don't want to have happen at your destiny or crime scene. And you may have seen this in other places. You may have heard me talk about these in other places. I do some explanation of each one. And these are important. These are things that will hurt your case or save your case, depending on how you ensure that they are happening or not happening. So without any further delay, let's jump in to those 10 things to be sure of, and then I'll catch you on the backside of that. Adjust your earbuds, turn up those speakers, and hang on. It's now time for this week's featured conversation. All right, the 10 most common mistakes at a death scene and during a death investigation. You know, due to the very nature of the sudden or violent death, there's a lot of things can go wrong in the first initial responses to a death scene and the first few hours after discovery. You know, they have their way of bringing a lot of individuals to a very small area, some with a lot of experience, some with very little experience. There's a lot of people that comes with certain responsibilities. Now, we have some smaller agencies where uh, the detective shows up on the scene, he interviews everybody, he collects all the evidence, he tracks down the suspects, and he makes the arrest. Then, of course, we have a lot of other agencies where there's two or three people or more that come to process the scene. But when that happens, that can be very chaotic. You know, you can have uh, regular patrol officers, detectives, CSI personnel, forensic people, Of course, your coroner medical examiner is going to be there uh, as well. Sometimes, depending on if it's a big case or or a high profile case, you may have prosecutors or police administrators showing up. We're going to talk more about police administrators here in a minute. And I I love police administrators. I used to be one. And there's nothing wrong with police administrators now. But let me tell you how some of them can um, kind of screw up a ball field here. Now, these things also may have like fire department, EMS personnel, If there's family, children involved, you may have your local family services or division of child or something like that show up uh, to take care of the children. So they can be very chaotic and a lot of errors can occur in a very chaotic scene. So number one, the number one most common mistake in a death scene is improper response and arrival at the scene. Now, in this case, I'm talking mostly about the initial patrol officer Uh, He is the first one to get the call. They're usually a lot closer than the detectives. And so he shows up at the death scene first. Now, they may not correctly respond to and secure the scene and the immediate surroundings. Sometimes they don't have the experience. Sometimes they're not really understanding what they're looking at. It's also not uncommon for uniformed officers who arrive on the scene not to stop or detain people leaving the scene or kind of milling around the scene. We need those people secured because it's very likely they could be a suspect. And then another thing I've seen over the years, and I know you probably can tell me you've seen it as well. While the patrol officers are waiting for detectives, there's usually maybe one or two more show up or something like that. And, and it's not uncommon for them to be standing around and congregating either inside the scene or too close to the scene. So they may have detained some people 
They may or may not have stretched out some yellow tape. And while they're waiting, then they just stand around and they talk and they smoke and they spit tobacco juice and, and um, you know, eat a power bar, whatever they have to do while they're waiting. And they're inadvertently contaminating the scene. So it's a big mistake to have patrol officers gathering inside the crime scene or, or too close to the crime scene while they're waiting on investigators. And then, of course, part of that is when they get there, they fail to notify investigators too soon or sometimes not at all. A patrol officer will go in and they'll assume that the death is suicide or natural and department policy sets in such a way that if it's natural, we don't call out detectives. But is that patrol officer trained enough to know whether it is a natural? What are they looking at? Are the patrol officers looking at the body or, or are they just seeing a, an old lady tucked away in her bed and she's dead so they assume it's natural and they just by protocol let the funeral home come or you know what are they doing because they don't have the experience or the training now again i'm painting with a broad brush i get that but when they think it's a suicide or a natural then they delay or they do not establish a crime scene or a parameter. And even if they're not stretching yellow tape and clearing off the block because grandma died in her sleep, even if they're not going that far, if they do believe it's natural and they've got reason to believe that, they can still secure the area. They can still secure people from milling around and making sure that somebody looks at the body and that there's some kind of something done for an investigation. And of course, that can happen often. And we've had cases, that not only that, that I have seen in my career, but others that I've read about, where it's a natural case, nobody's really done anything, they call the funeral home, the funeral home comes, takes the body away, and then lo and behold, a couple hours later, the funeral home is calling and saying, hey, do you know about the bullet hole in grandma? Or hey, would someone come take this knife out of grandma's belly? Uh, because no one looked at the body, and they assumed it was natural, and then there we go. So improper response and arrival at a scene, that's number one. All right, number two kind of falls in line with number one. And number two is failing to protect the crime scene, failing to protect the area. Of course, it's important in all death investigation, but especially if you think that there's a homicide involved, it's very important that they protect or someone protects the crime scene. And crime scene contamination is a significant problem in investigations today. No other aspect of investigations is more open to mistakes than the preservation and protection of the scene and the subsequent evidence gathered. If the scene isn't protected, it can be inadvertently contaminated, lost, or in some way molested, that it is not good evidence going forward, or it can have legal problems in court if the area was not properly protected. So, of course, it's paramount to the investigation that the first officer isolate and protect the scene and maintain the scene integrity so that he can testify not only to the detectives coming in, but also when it gets to court, that he followed these procedures, he cleared the scene, he secured the people, and he locked it down and cordoned it off, okay? And this includes monitoring everyone around. And I know if you're a patrol officer by yourself and you've got people around, it's tough, Hopefully you can get a couple of them there that's doing a job rather than just milling around. But you need to monitor and supervise paramedics, EMS, people like that. Think about this. If you arrive on a scene of a death call, paramedics are right behind you because it hasn't been pronounced yet. The paramedics run in and they're doing life-saving procedures. Fantastic. God love those people. But as a patrol officer, the first responding officers, you need to be watching them and monitoring them. And if they're moving things, you need to remember that and make notes and, and, and write, take pictures or write notes of what they've done. Because when detectives get there, investigators get there, they're going to see turned over tables or moved couches or was the lights on or the lights off or how were things before the paramedics went in and did their stuff. Okay. And you must also keep an eye on family members, neighbors, people that show up. It is not uncommon at a death scene after someone uh, is found that other family members start coming. And uh, a lot of times they're there pretty early. And so the patrol officer the, or, or whatever officers are on the scene has to protect these people. We also need to know who they are. We need to identify everyone at the scene 
when the first arrival, first officers arrive and everyone that subsequently arrives at the scene. If someone is there showing up or has come in to that area, we need to identify them because it very likely could turn out to be a suspect that's coming back into the scene to check on how things are progressing and or try to throw the police off or in some way contaminate the scene. And this is why we want the perimeter established and everyone out of the area of the crime scene proper and that we watch and document all activity that's going on around the scene. This could take a couple of officers, but it's very important that we do that. And again, that's a mistake. Mistake number two, failing to protect the crime scene. All righty, that brings us to number three. Number three of the top 10 biggest mistakes at a death scene. Number three, not handling suspicious death as a homicide. Not handling suspicious death as a homicide. Now, I want to say that all unattended death should be looked at and treated with a little caution, some suspicion. And I think that an experienced officer or investigator should go to the scene. Okay? Death should be treated as a homicide and a crime scene until facts are proven otherwise. Again, let me caution you. I am not suggesting that we cordon off a city block when grandma died in her sleep. I'm not suggesting that. But again, as I said earlier, there are some things that needs to be looked at. And if we're going to a scene that obviously isn't grandma just died in her sleep, right? It could be a suicide. It could be a homicide. But so many departments allow some of it's, I don't know, budgets, whatever. They allow untrained patrol officers to conduct basic death investigations with the assumption of suicide or natural death. Okay, and the thinking that it's very unlikely that it's homicides, we don't have but one or two homicides in our district a year, and they're usually a shooting or something along those lines. And so the chances of it being a homicide are very little. And so we're sure that it's natural or suicide. So we'll let the basic patrol officer work the investigation. Now, again, I'm not I'm not taking away from the patrol officer. Some of them are very well trained and well educated and they just happen to wear a uniform and they're as good as any detective out there. Fine. That, that's great. That's who I want there. I'm saying the mistake is too many departments allow newest of the new to do basic death investigation. And of course, when they're not trained, they're going to miss things like an altered scene a staged scene. You may have a homicide looking like a suicide. You may have an autoerotic fatality, which is an accident, but it's it's been altered and now it, lo- it may look like a natural or a homicide. There are things to look for for altered scenes, but you can't do that without training and or experience. And if the scene's not handled correctly from the beginning, if it's not hand, if a suspicious death is not handled correctly from the very start, If later it's found out to be a homicide, all of that valuable evidence of that that scene is lost because the officer went in with the person with the thinking that, well, this is a homicide or suicide. You collected a few pictures. You did a couple of things. But because it was a natural, I didn't need to do anything else. Well, because we didn't treat it with any type of security and suspiciousness, now We've lost our evidence if we find out later that it's a homicide. So we want to treat all unattended and or suspicious death as homicide type of thinking, except children and children and infants are totally different animal. We want to treat them with suspicion and we want to make sure that we collect the evidence and get the people in there to look at the scene with some experience. Mistake number four, responding to the scene with a preconceived notion. It is extremely important that investigators and patrol officers not allow themselves to respond to a scene with any preconceived conclusion about the case. You're a coroner, MDI, you're a police detective, and you get a call that says that you're, you need, you're needed at a suicide. And you get to the scene and the patrol officer says, yes, there's a suicide. This is what happened. You're the investigator. You go in, you work it as a suicide. OK, so it's it's very common to be given this type of information as the investigator. So if it looks like a suicide, it must be a suicide. So another and no other real investigation is done. These type of shortcuts is common and unfortunately can miss a lot of things. So 
coming to a scene with a preconceived notion of a suicide, preconceived notion of a natural, even maybe a preconceived notion of a homicide. What we don't want to do is create our narrative and then find the facts to fit our narrative. We don't want to show up with a preconceived notion. We want to show up with someone died. It is my job to determine how and by what manner. You've got to get rid of all the preconceived notions. And this can happen not only on suicides, like I said, but even on natural deaths. We assume it's natural. We assume it's accident. And yet it's something else. So as I said with investigators, but also with with patrol officers, if you're a patrol officer that works your own naturals and suicide and things like that, it's real easy to have a tendency to write a final report and collect the evidence necessary to fit the narrative. That's a huge injustice, and we are missing cases if we do that. All right, number five. So number five is failing to take sufficient photographs. You know, in today's world, digital photography is cheap and easy to obtain. But, you know, back when I started this business, we started with 35, I'm sorry, with Polaroids. Now, we had 35 millimeters as well, but we used Polaroids, instant photos, a lot. Go in, take four or five shots of the Polaroid, we're done. If you had a 35 millimeter, I could sometimes get two, three cases on one roll of film because it just wasn't something that these smaller departments where I started out did to take a lot of photographs. And it was money. There were budget issues. You had to buy the film, then you had to take it or send it off and have it developed because smaller departments don't have their own processing labs. And so you had to pay for that to be done. So there's not a lot of photographs taken. I consult on cases yet today and somebody will call me and say, uh, you know, I, I, they'll call me and ask me to look at something or I have contracted with an attorney or another agency or somewhere to take a look at a case and give them some ideas of investigative direction and things like that. And I will ask for, of course, all the police reports. I want everything. I, I want to know what you know so that I can look to see uh, for, with a new fresh set of eyes. And I ask for the photographs and all. And I cannot tell you the number of times that I get, I don't know, eight or 10, uh, maybe 20 photographs, not counting the autopsy photos, because there's a bunch of them there. I'm talking about the scene and the body. If you have a homicide and you've got 20 photographs, you haven't even gotten into the house yet. And yet that's the entire case. So that's mistake number five, failing, failing to take sufficient photographs. And as I said earlier, we need to take photographs from the initial point that the officer arrives and so that when EMS and paramedics and people change things, we know what things look like from the beginning. Because photographs are a way to document the scene and to freeze that scene in time. Once that picture is taken, that image is frozen in time. Okay, They're used in court if, if necessary to, to prove or disprove a fact. There may be a fact that there was blood spatter on the southeast living room wall. Well, the photograph will prove that there's blood spatter on that wall. So it can also disprove things. Someone may say, well, there was something in the house or not in the house. And, and so these will prove that I know of a case that was solved because somebody was looking back a couple of years later, or I'm sorry, about a year later at photographs and seeing something in a photo that wasn't mentioned in a report. And he questioned what that was. And luckily an investigator did seize it and it was a ring. And then the ring ended up, through a lot of channels, ended up solving the crime. But that was just by looking back through photos, saying, hey, what is this on the floor? And again, it's frozen in time. It was something that could then be tracked down. So it's vital that photographs are taken of the entire scene, the area, the location where the crime took place. If there are multiple locations of that death, then both of those areas need photographed specifically. And it from the beginning to the end. So when the first officers arrive, they need some photographs. But as the paramedics are moving stuff, they need more photographs. As the investigators come in and things are being done, they need more photographs. The body is being moved. They need more photographs. That needs to be documented as it progresses. Remember, you only get one chance at your first chance to document a scene. After, after you leave that scene, anything you go back to do is tainted. So photograph, photograph, photograph. So mistake number five was failing to take sufficient 
photographs from beginning to end. Mistake number six probably is kind of in the middle and it kind of sums up everything. Mistake six, failing to manage the crime scene process. Someone needs to be in charge of the crime scene process. In a small agency, it may be one guy doing everything, but someone needs to be involved. The investigator in charge, whoever that is, by whatever rank or title, the investigator in charge should oversee the investigation and the scene documentation, right? He or she should should ensure that the evidence is collected correctly, the chain of custody is maintained, everything is documented. They may be doing it themselves or they may be directing others to do it, but someone needs to kind of be in charge of the overall scene, okay? They should also be in charge of maintaining the integrity of the scene. Never allow officers to use the restroom in the residence. I was on a shooting just the other day and, you know, I had drank too much coffee before I went and I had been there for a while and things were starting to get a bit uncomfortable, if you know what I mean. Well, I couldn't use the restroom inside because I'm not going to mess up the integrity of the scene. I'm trying, you know, we're working, we're working blood spatter angles and, and did he, was it a suicide? Turned out that's how we're ruling it. But then there was somebody else there involved at the time. And so we had this big scene. Well, I couldn't use the restroom in there. And so luckily it was a rural enough area and there was enough vehicles outside. And well, you kind of understand probably what happened from that point. But I could no longer be up and down on that floor in the condition I was in. But I couldn't destroy the integrity of the scene. So I had to find another option. So be thinking about that. What is going to be the option if you're on a multi-hour scene? But don't allow officers to use the restroom. Don't allow them to take food or drink from the residence. Don't let them bring food or drink into your crime scene. But certainly don't let them go to the refrigerator and get a bottle of water and say, well, he don't need it anymore. You know, I'm telling you that happens. You know, they're hungry. They've been there for a while. They look around the cabins. They find some Little Debbie snack cakes and a bottle of water and they all share it. Well, number one, that's stealing. That's that. That's the first crime. And number two, that messes up the integrity of the crime scene and or what other evidence may be associated with it. Maybe nothing, but it doesn't matter. You can't be doing it. If you have to designate an area for officers to gather, and you might, you, you might have a lot of people there. You might have people coming in and out of the scene at certain for certain jobs at certain times. Then you, as the crime scene manager, the one in charge, should designate an area for officers to gather. So it, it might be on the in a northeast corner of the yard. You may rope off an area or something, but if officers need a place to come out of the crime scene but not leave the area, this is where they go. Fine, you know where everyone is. They can smoke, they can spit tobacco juice, they can they can drink and eat and whatever they need to in this protected area only. That way, if you see them out of that area as you're the one in charge, then they better be doing a job you've assigned them or they need to get back to their cage. Quite, quite honestly. Now, lead investigators also need to direct the crime scene personnel to what and where things need to be collected. Now, a lot of CSI staff will come in and they understand how to process a crime scene. They, if it's a bigger agency, they've done it a lot. They understand. However, the lead investigator may have an idea of what they want or what they want to look for in addition to what CSI may normally do. And CSI is going to ask the lead investigator, okay, what do we think we have here? Where do you want me to check for prints? Where do you want me to collect this? They're going to ask. And that lead investigator, whoever's in charge of that scene, needs to be directing the CSI staff, make sure we get this, make sure we get that. Oh, in the back bedroom, we've seen this. We need to collect that. They need to be doing that overview of the scene. Now, each one is unique. I know that. Uh, And the officer that's in charge may have to modify things per scene, but they need to make sure that the scene is searched adequately and evidence is collected adequately, whether he's doing it or a full CSI team. Also, as part of managing the, the, the crime scene process, the victim's body should always be inspected and searched for trace evidence prior to being moved or taken from the scene. I know this is kind of common, 
But I also know that there's a lot of agencies that do not do it, mostly in smaller agencies. But, well, let's just bag the body and we'll let the medical examiner look for trace evidence. If you've been listening to me very long or taken any of my training, you will know that that is an absolute no-no because it is a very low chance that trace evidence will be found at autopsy. Hairs, DNA, things like that can certainly be lost during transport. Also, be sure that you stop and look around, you know, stop, look, listen, all of that, and look up as much as around. You need to look at the ceilings as much as you do the walls. Uh, See what's missing, what's there, what isn't there, what looks right, what don't look right, what feels right, what doesn't feel right. Is what you're seeing matching what you're being told? And above all, as the one in charge of the scene, never leave a scene until you are confident that every answer to any question you may have has been answered or documented. As I said a while ago, you only get one chance at your first chance. All right, number seven. The number seven of the top 10 most common mistakes of a death scene is failing to evaluate victimology. Failing to evaluate victimology. It is of utmost importance that the investigators know the victim and completes a victimology study. This is part of the history, part of the victim history. Develop a victimology, a study of the victim. You know, you can't properly investigate a death without knowing the victim, without knowing the victimology. You can't, you really can't investigate a homicide unless you know the victim. Who, what's their lifestyle? What are they like? Who are they with? Are they in the drug scene? Are they not in the drug scene? Are they in a racist uh, group? Are they, are, are they just a, a church going librarian? What, what, who are they? Failing to have a complete picture of who the victim is will preclude you from developing suspects, motives, identifying any risk factors that the victim may have. You know, uh, risk factors are usually regarded as uh, as either high, moderate, or low. So if if they have risk factors in their life, as in they're a drug dealer, that could be a high risk factor, or they could be a low risk factor, meaning that they live alone, they're an unmarried librarian in her mid-50s who attends church every time the door is open. That's probably a very low risk factor. But there could be something else in her life you find that makes her moderate or high. And all of these risk factors are based on lifestyle, living conditions, job skills, neighborhood, or anything specific to that victim. And by knowing these things, then you can put a risk factor tag to them, high, moderate, or low, and it will help you narrow in on the person and who could be a suspect or how this crime might have occurred. And it's pretty simple. A victimology or a study of the victim, you know, it's just a collection and assessment of any significant information that contains to, as I said earlier, their lifestyle, okay? And you got to know things like their personality. Are they employed? What's their education? Uh, You know, things like their friends and their habits, maybe their hobbies. Are they married? Is it their third married? Are they divorced? Are are they going through a messy divorce? Are they having an affair? What type of relationships do they have? What about their sexuality? Are they openly gay? Do you find in your investigation that they're closeted gay? What's their reputation in town and among their friends and among their family? Uh, do they have a criminal history? Do they have a drug history or alcohol history? Are they an AA? Or uh, did they just get out of prison last year for selling uh, meth? You know, uh, the neighborhood, the where they live, where did they grow up? Is where they grew up differently than where they're currently living? I mean, did they did they grow up in a five million dollar home neighborhood and now they're living in the ghetto, or vice versa? You know, what a what their lifestyle like? What their living conditions are like? Bottom line is this, who was the victim and what was going on with them at the time of their demise? And of course, some of the best information would be friends, family, employers, neighbors. You need to know the victim better than they knew themselves, especially when you're working a homicide. You cannot effectively work a homicide and might I say even a suicide without a full and complete victimology. 
And number eight is a, a one that I think missed a lot. So number eight, failing to conduct an efficient area canvas. Area canvas. That's something that a lot of times it's not thought about. There's a lot of times in small to mid-sized departments, area canvases just aren't done. Now, I will be the first to admit that conducting an area canvas can be very tedious. It can be time consuming and it can put in a lot of man hours to do so, depending on how many main neighbors you have in the area or how populated it is. And sometimes even hundreds of contacts can be made without a shred of usable information. I get that. But it's that one or two pieces of information that may very well send you in the right direction. Now, you know, most books that you read, most courses that you take, they really don't tell you how to do one. They just tell you to do one. But ideally, patrol personnel and plainclothes detectives should perform separate canvases. You know, in the immediate time frame, patrol officers can go through the area once they're released from the scene. Remember, they're congregating over there with nothing to do. So you, as the one in charge of the scene, you might just give them a job. Start having them go door to door, give them four or five questions that you want them to ask, make all of them ask the same questions to every door that they knock on and see if you can't develop a lead. Surprisingly, in the first few hours after uh, a death, uh, especially a homicide, it's amazing what you might learn. Oh, you know what? I did see a red pickup parked there last night. I didn't think anything of it. But now that you're asking, yeah, I see the red pickup there last night. Well, First off, if you don't ask, you don't know. And secondly, if if a detective don't get by there till a week later, that person might not be home at the time. They might not have been there then, or they might have even forgot that that pickup was there because, again, it really didn't mean much to them. But now that you're asking, it does. And another reason why you want to go separately is sometimes people won't respond to patrol officers because, you know, they other people see patrol officers at the door. So, Un- ununiformed, plainclothes officers sometimes will get more information. Also, it's more anonymous. And and I will be the one to say that if you're in an area, you need to dress like the area. So, again, if you're in a five million dollar housing area, then wearing a wearing a tie and a jacket is no big deal. If you're in the hood, wearing a tie and jacket, you're gonna be the popo. It don't it don't, you're either popo or you're a salesman, right? So. Yeah, I'm not saying you have to put on, you know, your 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 baggy pants, but you have to do something to not stand out as bad. OK, um, now you're going to depending on the area, you may stand out just because you stand out. But try not to make yourself stand out too much because people don't want to tell the police if they think other people are seeing the police there. So, again, try to blend in somewhat. And I've always found it funny that they give detectives the patrol cars with the antennas on the back sometimes they have state license regular state license plates on them sometimes they have department license plates but it is not uncommon for people to look at a car parked in the neighborhood somewhere and say that's the police so if you're going to do an area canvas that you want to be a little incognito then maybe you need to borrow a different truck borrow somebody's car take your own car i don't know but but a police car even if it is quote unquote unmarked probably isn't the the best option Of course, the primary goal of a neighborhood canvas or an area canvas is to locate witnesses. And understand, it's not just the eyewitnesses that you're looking for. Sometimes it's the ear witness. Sometimes it's somebody that's heard something. You know, someone may have heard a threatening remark. Someone may have heard a gunshot at a certain hour or even heard how and or in what direction somebody fled. Sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, I don't know anything but this. I know that if something happened in our neighborhood, that Big Bubba is going to know about it. And so if you want to know who did what, you call Big Bubba. Well, I, I've never heard of Big Bubba before, so yeah, I think I'll call him. Or you may hear something like, look, I don't know if this means anything or not, but she was over at my house the other night drinking tea, and she told me, that she'd had somebody coming into the library and was trying to get on a date with her and was kind of hanging around. And she mentioned to me that she got home the other night and this guy was sitting on her front porch. They had a conversation. He went on his way, but she's scared of him. And I don't really know who he is except that I know 
that she called him Johnny, and she said that he showed up like day before yesterday in the morning at her work. Well, okay, I don't know if that means much, but now if the if the library has cameras, you can go on the day before yesterday and look at the video and see who came in, who talked to her. Uh, you may get a better idea of who Johnny is, and that may be your prime suspect. May not be, but without asking the neighbors some questions, you certainly wouldn't have probably known anything about it. Or maybe her co-workers would have, but did you go talk to the co-workers? Did you work your victimology to find these things out? See how important it is to be asking people questions? You can get put pointed in the right direction. You know, a witness who hears that a homicide sub suspect fled in the vehicle with a loud muffler, you know, that could furnish a valuable lead, you know, or, or a color of a vehicle, you know, something like that. That can be crucial in finding who finding an investigative lead or finding who the person might be or what direction they went to or who might have more information. All right. So be sure that area canvases are conducted properly and are conducted on any suspicious, any suspicious homicide, any suspicious death, any homicide, and possibly even a suicide. If you would think that would gain you some type of good information. All right. And that brings us to number nine. In the top 10 most common mistakes at a death scene, number nine is failing to work together as a team. You know, as with any crime scene, cooperation among differing agencies is crucial. It's paramount. You know, but with a death scene, this cooperation becomes even more important, but also more strained. Because the severity of the scene, you know, the spotlight is on, all the investigators and all the agencies that get this accomplished. There's a lot of type A personalities and egos that's running the muck in there. And they can become a disaster really quickly. You have fire departments that don't understand crime scene procedures. You have EMS that's got one goal to save life. They may or may not understand crime scene procedures either. You've got them working together with the patrol officers, with the lead detectives. Now you throw the coroner and medical examiner involved in it. You've got different experience levels. All of this can become a problem real quick. You know, one of the most significant issues in a major case is failing to communicate the information to those working the case. Agencies seem to want to keep what they know to themselves. And that's a disservice. And now I know that there are, you know, there are some situations where you feel like you want to keep the information to yourself. But if you've got multiple agencies working the case, then they may need to know the information that you have. You know, a coroner, a medical examiner may very well need to know some of the information that you have so that will help them make the right manner ruling. But at the same time, you're going to need to know what they know. You're going to need to know what manner they're ruling is to know which direction you need to go. So you need to share some information. And this occurs most of the time because of turf wars and egos. The sheriff don't like the police chief or the police chief don't like the coroner or whatever. Right. And and, you know, there's a whole lot of type A personality there and it compromises the outcome. And our job is to get the right answers for the family. And ultimately, we work for the victim. And if we can't keep our egos in in check and we can't seem to get along and cooperate, we're doing a disservice to everyone involved in that case, especially the victim. Everyone involved in the investigation is after the same conclusion, and that is the truth. They're all, they all want the same thing. So not cooperating is actually causing everybody not to get the primary goal of the truth. Now, each member has a job to do, and that information is gathered from that job. The information is combined, evaluated, and it helps set the direction and ultimately the conclusion of the investigation. Right now, I understand that we want to stay in our own mud puddles. I don't need I don't need a detective getting involved with me invest working the body. I don't need the CSI people throwing fingerprints around in an area that they they're not they don't need to be throwing fingerprints around. I don't need the fire department out there interviewing witnesses. Everyone has a job to do, and I make this analogy a lot of times in classroom training. When it comes to cooperation, we do we all do have a job at the scene. So we all need to stay in our own mud puddle. And if we stay in our own mud puddle and we're splashing around in our own mud puddle, it isn't very long before we've all stomped out a pond, right? But if we all start jumping between each other's mud puddles, 
all we're going to have is a mess. So we all do our job in combination and in coordination with everyone else's job. You know, my job is the body, let's say, as the coroner MDI. My job is the body. But maybe I don't go in and move the body and remove and remove the body until the lead investigator is ready for that to happen. But lead investigator, understand that the coroner MDI needs access to that body to get you th- information like time of death, insect activity. Maybe there's some hair or fiber on the body that needs to be collected quickly that might get lost or blown away as people are walking around. So keeping the MDI out of the scene for six or eight hours and then having them come in and expect them to do their job, well, you've held them out. You know, well, what what about if the patrol officer was taking pictures and doing his thing and holding you out of the scene until he was ready for you to come in and do your part? Doesn't work that way. Everyone needs to work together, but but we all have to coordinate and cooperate. You know, a baseball game is only won when everybody playing does his or her job. A pitcher cannot win a ball game. A first baseman by himself cannot win a ball game because there's never been a pitch throw, right? So everyone has a job to do. Everyone needs to do that job and work together as a team, and then the case becomes successful. All right, that brings us to number 10. Now, these were in no particular order. Some, I think, are more important than others in specific crime scenes at specific times. But So these aren't in any particular order. But number 10 of the 10 most common mistakes at a death scene is command and administrative personnel interfering. I say that again. Command staff interfering with the scene. It is so frustrating to have command staff show up at a scene and their only agenda is to have nothing to do with the actual investigation. Their only agenda is to be there for the for political reasons, political appearance, to be on TV or 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 to be there because it's a high profile thing. If they're not a part of the investigation, they don't need to be there or they need to stay in the area where the other officers are caged and, and congregating. They have to be part of the investigative team really to be inside the scene. Low card principle says that every interaction leaves a trace and takes a trace. So if you've got command staff coming in and out of a scene, you wouldn't allow your rookie patrolman to walk in and look around, uh, hit and miss. But because they've got captain bars, because they've got, you know, an eagle on their collar and they're the chief, all of a sudden he can come walking around and, and doing what he wants because no one has the intestinal fortitude to say chief get out of the scene or the chief doesn't have enough and i I hate to use the word sense but somehow or another he's forgetting about crime scene integrity and he feels that since he's chief since he's sheriff since he's captain or lieutenant commander he can come walking around and doing whatever the heck he wants to and nobody has the guts, guts to tell him not to that messes up a crime scene now you get somebody on you know you you call a sheriff on the court a few times and have him testify as to why he was in the scene then that might keep him coming in there now do, do command staff have a reason to be at the scene sometimes 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 in small departments they're the lead investigator they are the lead investigator and they are directing what everybody else should be doing fantastic he's got a function sometimes they're there because it is a very high profile case and he does need to be the face for the media I get that. That's fine. But just the random everyday rape and killing of somebody in their home, I don't need every lieutenant and above at the crime scene simply because someone is dead naked. It doesn't help. And in fact, it hurts greatly because they're showing up when they have no need to and no one has the ability to tell them to leave and it just causes more and more problems. So if you're a lead investigator and you do not have a department policy, an agency policy that talks about this, you might want to bring this up to the command staff. Because if they show up and start, and you're the lead investigator, and you're directing people to do things, and you've got a path and a plan and a process, and then Lieutenant Commander or Captain So-So or Police Chief Smith shows up, and then, of course, because they're the police chief, they're in charge, and they start directing people to do things, you may or may not know they're directing them to do it. It may be counterproductive to what you've already assigned somebody to do and 
you're not even aware that it's going on, which causes there to be a breakdown in communication and the ultimate investigation. So you should have a conversation with your command staff ahead of time. And if you are command staff listening to this, you need to think about creating a policy and a way of doing business that says we have trained our staff, we've trained our investigators, they know what to do. If I feel like I'm the captain and I need to show up, then I'm going to stay out of the area. I'm going to let the lead investigator know, say, hey, you know, sergeant investigator, I'm here. I'm going to be outside. I'm over here in the area. If you need me, if you need more resources, if you need anything, you let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to stay out of the scene. And could you come in about an hour or so and update me and let me know what's going on in case I get any questions above me? Perfect. Fine. No problem. We're not trying to keep you out of the loop, Captain. We just don't need your footprints through our blood, right? That's what it all boils down to. If you don't need to be there, stay away or at least stay out. All right. So let me recap the top 10, starting with number one, improper response and arrival to the scene. Number two, failing to protect the crime scene. Everything's just hit and miss, hither and yon, failing to protect it. Number three, not handling a suspicious death as a homicide, responding with a preconceived notion, arriving on the scene with a preconceived notion that it was a suicide and you work it as such. Number five, failing to take sufficient photographs. Digital photography is cheap. Take a lot. Number five, failing to take photographs. Number six, failing to manage the crime scene process. Someone has to be in charge, manage the process. Seven, failing to evaluate victimology. Again, you must know the victim better than they know themselves. Number eight, failing to conduct an efficient area canvas. Area canvases are not necessary on every single death, but on any suspicious death and most certainly homicide, there needs to be a complete area canvas. Number nine, failing to work together as a team. Remember, we're all in the same team here, folks. And number 10, command staff and administrative personnel interfering with the crime scene. You know, so here's the, here's the conclusion thoughts on this. Death investigations are not always simple step-by-step-by-step cutouts. They require real attention and very specific actions to protect an investigation integrity. They have to be done in a certain process in a certain manner with certain rules pr to protect the integrity. And a lot of the mistakes mentioned here are from shortcutting and not taking, really not being serious about the gravity of the scene that you're working. You know, ah, oh, well, you know, this, this doper hung himself. Oh, well, no big deal, blah, blah, blah. Well, we're not taking it serious. You know, our job as a death investigator, regardless of what function it is, detective, patrol officer, coroner, MDI, our job as an investigator in any type of a death is to get the truth for the victim and ultimately to bring justice to anyone responsible for their death, if in fact anyone was responsible. So it's our job to determine if someone's responsible, and then we present the facts to the powers that be, and then they do their job. But our job is to get the truth and collect the facts correctly. So if we develop and follow strict policies at every death scene, then you ensure that the investigations are worked properly and evidence isn't missed. We need protocols. Uh, we need guidelines, we need checklists, we need policies, whatever it is. So when we go to a death scene, these things are done. They're done every time. They're done in this order based upon these principles, based upon these facts. And it's every time, every time, every time. And we don't miss stuff that way. But going in to hither and yon and letting, you know, six-month-old rookies do death investigations is not necessarily the best for the family. So, I'm sure there's more mistakes. I'm sure you could probably come up with 10 more that you've seen. And so, again, if you agree or disagree with any of these 10 that I've brought up, shoot me an email. Uh, put it in the comments on the show notes on cornertalk.com so that we can all get a conversation started about it. Because it's, it's real interesting to see what some other comments are, what, what some people have, things like that. So, top 10 most common mistakes at a death scene. Be sure that you go back and listen, take notes, and so that you don't make these mistakes yourself. All right. And of course, if you want a complete list of that, you can go to the cornertalk.com to the show notes. And then 
the top 10 are there with some explanations under each one. And so you'll be able to, to look at that, copy, print, whatever, and see more about, about that. And so, like I said, if you have comments, please leave those. If you need anything else from me, you know how to get a hold of me, cornertalk.com. You can also find me through the Academy page. We're here to do one thing, and that is to help you be a better investigator. So if you need help in training, if you have questions, you just shoot me a line, and I'll help you in every way I can. Remember, uh, MDI Online Academy coming up in a couple of weeks. I hope to see you there. I'll help you in every way I can there as well. And remember, summertime is coming, the beach, the ocean, float trips, vacations. But in all of these, it puts you in contact with people that you're not always in contact with. So it gives you ability to show a blessing to someone, even a smile, hold open the door and say hi. Sometimes that is a big blessing in someone's life. So until next week, everybody, find a way to be a blessing. And above all, say it with me, above all, be safe. Thanks for listening to Coroner Talk, a DSPN media production. Visit our website at coronertalk.com. And be sure to like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash coroner training. 3617-1024 scene en route to morgue.